Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this Easter Sunday wanting to hear from you. So please teach us. Teach us from your word. Please give us encouragement. Help us to understand what it means for Jesus to rise from the dead. And help us to believe it and change our lives. Change our lives, Lord, so that we might bring glory to you in all things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See, when our world is turned upside down, the pillars on which we have built our lives, when they begin to crack and crumble under the weight of our circumstances, it's normal and very natural to ask questions to wonder if the foundations that we've depended on were ever strong enough. It's natural to ask if we've been building on shifting sand or if we've been building on solid ground. And I know some of you listening today are asking this very question. Is there anything strong enough to weather this storm? And whoever you are, I want to convince you today that there is one thing that we can depend on. A foundation strong enough to hold us up, whatever may come, because this one thing will remain. And that one thing is the one series of events that changed history. The series of events that the Bible called the gospel. And if you are a Christian, I want to do what Paul is doing in this chapter. I want to remind you of this gospel. It has been preached to you. You have received it. On it, you have taken your stand. You have built your life on this gospel. This gospel has saved you. This good news has saved you. And so it is more important now than ever that you hold firmly to this gospel. Otherwise, if you let it go, if you give it up now, all will be in vain. And you will be swept away with nothing to hold you down. So brothers and sisters, please hold on to these truths. Let them be your anchor. Let them be your solid ground. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also. This, this is the series of events that changed history. Christianity, friends, is not a way of life based on the philosophical reflection of some guru. Christianity is not a collection of wisdom accumulated after many centuries and put together as stories. It's not an idea generated in, in the mind of a revolutionary. No, Christianity is the outworking of a series of historical events. It is the result of something that happened in history. Events that completely changed the world. That 2,000 years ago, a man by the name of Jesus died for the sins of his people to bring forgiveness, to reconcile them to God, according to the Scriptures. That means it was predicted in the Bible, and he really died. His lifeless body 
was buried. But also, as predicted in the Holy Scriptures, he was raised to life three days after he died. And this wasn't the imagination of a few die-hard followers. He physically appeared to many people. At one time, 500 people were there. At the same time, they were there. And surely you can see how these events would change the world. And it continues to shape our lives today. The reality of a man who died to reconcile humanity to God and defeated death by rising again. That changed everything. If you are a parent, I'm sure you are teaching your children to eat all sorts of different types of food. Uh, one of our family proverb is... You don't have to like it, you just have to eat it. My kids know it by heart, and they say it all the time when it's their sibling who doesn't want to eat something they don't like. It's really hard not to be the dad or to be like a dad when I'm around other people too. Like one time, someone told me they just don't eat fruit. And I find out that they're not allergic to fruit or anything, they just don't do it. They don't like fruit. So I suddenly just find myself going into dad mode and I say, no, no, you have to eat fruit. It keeps you regular and you don't, you don't have to like it. You just have to eat it. And then I found out later on, apparently when they were young, their parents made them eat fruit. And one time trying to force themselves to swallow a piece of fruit, it got stuck and they started choking. And it was, apparently it was very traumatic and it made them unable to eat fruit ever again. Now, some events have that, that great effect in your life. Well, let me tell you one event that must have the greatest effect. This one. Jesus rising again and appearing to people, his friends, his followers, at one time, 500 people were there, appearing to them in bodily form. Well, that has to have an effect on us today. And let me tell you, it has great effect on us today who are facing death. Our news on the coronavirus had been dominated by two things in the last week or so. Uh, the first thing is, Who's getting fined for flouting lockdown laws? Um, who's still going to the beach? Or who got caught going to their holiday home? Or who's playing cricket with their mates and got fined $1,000 each? Or who's just going for a drive for no reason and got stopped by the police? But the second thing that really dominated the coronavirus news is this, how many people have died. And in Australia, we've actually been quite fortunate. Our government had acted reasonably quickly and many lives had been saved as a result of that. But all over the world, people are dying in the thousands every day from this disease. In the thousands, daily. And in many parts of the world, it's just beginning. And these are mostly numbers in developed countries with sophisticated healthcare systems. We are a world gripped in the cruel jaws of death. And you will know this too, you will feel it too, especially if you know someone who is in hospital right now, or in ICU, or on ventilators, or if you know someone who had passed because of this cruel disease especially if they were close to us. More than ever, the fragility of our lives is made so evident. This virus does not discriminate. It will take the rich and the poor alike. But we have to remember 
however extraordinary our situation is at the moment, there's actually nothing novel about it. It's not new. Because death had always been there, it had always had a 100% success rate. People have been dying every day ever since humanity turned away from God. Hundreds of thousands of people die every day in this world with or without the coronavirus. And long after this virus has passed, death will still remain. It continues to prowl like a hungry lion ready to devour each one of us, waiting for our time to be up. And death does not discriminate either. It kills the rich and the poor, the young and the old, the good and the bad. C.S. Lewis the English author and thinker said the same thing uh, when the world was gripped by the fear of the atomic bomb in 1948. He said this, in other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. And I want you to know, friends, I do not say this glibly. Death is terrible and it is horrendous. I know this from personal experience. Death has broken into my home and stolen someone I love in the dead of night. I know how horrifying death is. Death, it is the most unnatural thing there is but we have normalized it. We've grown accustomed to it. We've learned to ignore it. But from time to time, it growls and it roars. It calls us to attention. It bears its fangs. And we find ourselves in a nightmare we cannot wake up from. Like the last few weeks, death has roared and we find ourselves again in a world gripped in the cruel jaws of death, we've woken up and we've realized that this has always been the case. And that is why the reason Jesus is the only hope we have. That is why that event in history, when Jesus conquered the undefeated enemy, is such great news to us today. It gives us hope to a world in the grip of death. One man had defeated death. His name is Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. The resurrection was not a once in a history fluke, never to be repeated again. Like, you know, throwing a coin in the air and have it land on its edge. Apparently, there is a one in 6,000 chance for that happening. So, there's something for you to do when you're bored at home. No, not a fluke. The resurrection of Jesus is a promise. You see that word? See that word, first fruits? It's a metaphor from the Old Testament, the first portion of the crop that guarantees a full harvest. It's like the first installment. Christ rising from the dead was not an isolated event. There is a connection between that event and us. It guarantees the resurrection of those who belong to him. Christ has defeated death. He rose from the dead. Death could not keep him. The grave could not contain him. And that event is a promise to us that he will defeat death for us too. The prowling beast had been defanged and declawed by the risen Jesus. 
And one day when Jesus returns, this beast called death will be put down. Death will be destroyed. And we who belong to Jesus will rise from the dead. Friends, notice, this is a promise for those who belong to Jesus. That is why to keep holding on to Jesus is so important. That is why we cannot abandon Him now. That is why we must rest safely in Jesus alone. For he is the ark that will keep us safe in the flood. This is also an invitation to you if you do not belong to Jesus. It's an invitation for you to put your trust in him, to follow him. And if you want to know what that means, if you want to know what it means to belong to Jesus, Go and chat with that friend who invited you to join us today. Or come and chat with me. Go to our website, sun.kwy.ch. I will be on a Zoom meeting straight after this, and you can come and talk to me about it, and you can ask all your questions, and I will do my best to answer them. But let me tell you this now. Christ is our only hope in this world gripped in the cruel jaws of death. He can be your hope too. But you know what? The reason Jesus has implications for the living too, for you and me who still breathes today, even as we face death, because when you belong to Jesus, when you know that death had been defanged and declawed by Jesus, and that one day death will be put down and you will rise with Jesus, that changes the way you live. Hebrews chapter 2 talked about what Christ did for us when he defeated death. Hebrews 2 verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, in verse 15, and free, this is what Christ accomplished by defeating death, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. With death prowling around us, we are gripped by the fear of death. We were enslaved by this fear. And the only way we could deal with it ourselves was to close our eyes, pretend that we are invincible, delude ourselves that somehow we can escape its jaws. We distract ourselves with silly games and the busyness of the modern world. And we put our hope in things that can only delay death, but never defeat it. But Jesus accomplished what a million distractions can never do. He freed us. He freed us from the slavery of the fear of death. Look at Paul. In this chapter, he knew what Christ had done, the sure promise that he has in the risen Jesus. That is why he willingly endangered himself. He willingly faced death because he has something greater than human hopes. He has something greater than the distractions of eating and drinking and the meaninglessness of life in the face of death. He has the hope of the risen Jesus. Friends, if you belong to Jesus, we have that hope too. We can live a life that has greater meaning than delaying the inevitable, just pushing it further and further, knowing 
that one day we will face it. We can work now for something that will last even in six billion years. We can walk the path of self-sacrifice. We can serve the need of others. We can face the storm that is coronavirus because we have been freed from the slavery of the fear of death. Because our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in the risen Christ. And He has given us a sure promise that that day will come when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when this is our battle hymn in the face of death, we can be free from from the oppression of death. We can live with hope because of the risen Jesus. You see how our lives can change even today. Even in a world gripped in the fear of death, even in a world gripped in the very jaws of death. Our lives can have meaning that is greater than whether or not we lose our jobs or whether or not our businesses will survive and even whether or not we will live or die. And again, I do not say that glibly. These are all very serious, significant things in our lives. But something had happened that trumps them all. Christ is risen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I don't know if you've been enjoying at home with Colin. Uh, Colin Buchanan had been doing Facebook live streams in the last two weeks. And I hope he keeps doing it because it's been so encouraging. And in the last one, he finished with this song which I think speaks of what I want to convey to you, my brothers and sisters. It speaks of what I want to share with you, my church family. So thank you, Colin, for putting it in song. So I want to sing this song now. The musicians have recorded everything before I even started my sermon. So that's why I have to sing it myself today. But it's a song that would really encourage your children too. So I reckon if you've got kids, bring them over, hold them tight, and sing this song together with them. strong and courageous the Lord of the ages holds his little one safe by his side be strong and courageous the Lord of the ages holds all his little ones safe do not fear the darkness do not fear the sadness Nor fear the sickness. Jesus had conquered them all. Be strong and courageous. The Lord of the ages holds all his little ones safe by his side. Be strong and courageous. The Lord of the ages holds all his little ones safe. Not be the enemy, do not be the poverty, do 
not fear eternity. Jesus has conquered them all. Be strong and courageous, the Lord of the ages. He holds his little one safe by his side. Be strong and courageous, the Lord of the ages. Holds all his little ones safe. He holds all his little ones safe. He holds all his little ones safe. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks. That even in times like this, we know that you don't abandon us because Christ is risen. Because Jesus has conquered it all. So we have nothing to fear. Even in the face of death, even in the face of sickness and poverty, we know Christ has conquered it all. Help us to always remember this so that we might hold on to him. The ark that keeps us safe in this flood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.